Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let me just get myself set up here. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you to the BCS team for just very, being very creative also in helping us understand even better and to encourage us, to motivate us toward the NV. Right, so allow me first of all to welcome everyone back to Ephesians. Uh, I know we took a break from Ephesians. We went through our um, Life Question series with Good Friday and Easter, and now we're back at Ephesians chapter 6. Um, there will be a slight adjustment though, uh, because usually, you know, we are in Ephesians, and now it's actually the, what Paul writes to be the household code, right? And actually it starts in chapter 5. Uh, but because today we have our youth with, uh, with us for the first week, and so we figured that it would be a good time, even as we have the youth among us, to then bring forward a little bit uh, Ephesians chapter 6, part on children and family. Now, I will be returning to talking about husbands and wives in next week's sermon. Right, so, yeah, so as mentioned, we are in this section of Ephesians, which is what Paul wrote, and it's about the household code. Because Ephesians is a book about how we are transformed in Christ, how we are made new. The last time I spoke about walking in love, walking in light, and Pastor Rick then expounded on walking by the Spirit. And so at this moment, Paul is now going to the practical part. And he's saying, therefore, that in order to live out this walking in love, walking in light, walking in spirit, the best place to try this out, to live out this new life, actually is in our families. And that's why the husbands, wives, firstly, and then parents and children. So I thought this morning I'd share, especially for those of us who are new, I see, I'm sectored this today, I see a lot of new faces. I'm just going to introduce to you my own family, parents, children, and so this is a picture of my family. Uh, I am a father of three boys. Let me rephrase. I'm a very tired father of three boys. <laughs> Why? Well, this picture was taken in 2020. It, uh, it was taken, as you can hopefully see, it's from Chinese New Year. And you know, Chinese New Year, many of us take family photos and we put them on social media. And so this was posted on social media and, you know, with media that comments, right? And so one comment mentioned, picture perfect family. <laughs> Whoever stinger, I, I so agree with you. <laughs> this picture is special to me because, trust me, uh, this is far from picture perfect. Right before this, this is special because right before this picture, five minutes before, FYI, I three boys, one boy was on the ground rolling in a tantrum, the second boy was pulling my first boy's uh, hair and all that kind of thing. My first boy was making my wife angry. My wife, because he was angry, I became angry the boss making my wife angry. And all my wife wanted was, why can't we take a decent family picture? And here I was inside. I was thinking, and by the way, I, I was at fault too, you know. I, I said something insensitive. I told my wife, Adeline, please forgive me. But I told her, dear, why do we want to take a family picture? Why do we want to put something so fake, you know, where everyone's smiling? Actually, just five minutes ago, right, we were at each other's throats. What's the point of taking this picture? What? Men, if that happens in our family, please do not say that. That didn't work out. It, it, it caused my wife to, to, to actually start crying, you know, and she said, all I want is a decent family picture. Is that so hard to ask? And I see nods. <laughs> in the congregation. Because that's, that's family, isn't it? It's, it's, it's far from picture perfect. Far from it, right? The reality about families, and the reality actually about today's passage is that it's short. It's only four verses, parents and children. The commands are not easy. But I come today humbly with you because recognizing that while the command might seem to be direct and easy, it's not, is it? It's not. It's, families are far more complex. Emotions, past hurts, all come in. And even as I preach God's word today, I recognize that for many of us, we come from broken homes. For some of us, our, we don't have parents, frankly, who were worthy of honor. 
They maybe left us a long time ago. They gave us nothing but trouble. For some of us, the other way, we have children who have rebelled and perhaps even left the home and caused us to feel so uptight and angry about things. For some of us, we might have, well, past hurts, history, where abuse has come in. And it's hard to take. For some of us, even frankly, we prefer to be left alone because family relationships are never perfect. They are never picture perfect. And frankly, we don't want to deal with it. I'd rather you my friends than my family. And that's a reality for many of us today, I believe. Therefore, I kind of felt led at the start, speaking to both youth and to parents alike, even those of us who are older children because we have parents who are aged, perhaps the start is that for all the commands that we will hear from God's word today, I pray then that we have the wisdom and humility to appropriate it to our situation. I do empathize with many of you. I wish I could cover the many family challenges that we face, but may the Lord grant us wisdom. And perhaps then I'll point you to something better, something bigger. Because in the midst of this picture-perfect family that many of us, frankly, try to put forward. That's a reality, right? We are far from perfect people and families. But, but, in following Ephesians, we have a perfect gospel. We have a perfect God. And so, perhaps, I propose to us this this morning, that despite the challenges we face in our families, a perfect gospel can transform imperfect people in imperfect families to still glorify a perfect God. So may the Lord truly help us appropriate His Word in our families today and may we submit ourselves to Him as we hear His Word. Before I Coming us in prayer, may I invite us to rise as we read from Scripture together from Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 4. Shall we rise and declare God's word together? 1, 2, and 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, this morning of all mornings, it is perhaps good and right that we call you and acknowledge that you are Abba, Father, our perfect Father in the midst of our broken and imperfect families. But we thank you then that the brokenness that we live in today will not and should not have the last word. But even then, as we strive to love our perfect, powerful, all-loving God, Father, Humble our hearts today. Soften our hearts. Help us know that you are with us, have been with us, that you understand the challenges each of us have faced, are facing in our families. And I commit each of our hearts, our hands, our lives, our loved ones into your hands, asking that you transform us by the power of your word, your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So for once again, for those of us who are new, I hope you have your bulletins with you and you can follow me in a short outline at the back. Um, and the first people that Paul speaks of, once again, four short verses, but the first people that Paul, Paul speaks to are children. He has three verses for our children here. And maybe the one thing I would want us to recognize and realize is that here, notice that Paul is not talking to parents about their kids. 
I say again, Paul is not talking to parents about their kids. He is talking to children directly. He is talking to children as part, as important part of the congregation and the life of the church. So he's addressing them specifically, right? And here as well, the children here, um, the Greek scholars basically say that here, these children can refer not just to young people, but it pretty much refers to everyone. And the reality is all of us are children. The only times that we don't become children perhaps will be when our parents have passed on. But what I'm saying here is then that this command is lifelong. And the reality also then is that we are going called to honour our parents throughout their entire life. So this command doesn't apply just to kids and young children or youth, where my dear youth are seated, with, seated today, but to all of us. And this idea of honour then basically refers to value, giving worth, value to, in this case, our parents. But also we know that because this command is lifelong, some of the applications, therefore, I pray that as the Word of God convicts you, you would think of how to apply it to your own particular context. Because the way a 12-year-old or a 7-year-old uh, translates and applies honour and obey to parents will be very different from, say, a 25-year-old who's going to get married or a 60-year-old who has an aged parent in their 1890s. How we honour will look different. But the biblical principles remain. But for those of my youth and children who are in our midst today, um, while the case remains that, yes, this applies throughout, the first verse about children obeying your parents is a bit more specific to those who are younger. Because for those who are younger, especially us who live under our parents' roof, the reality is that honour in that life stage would surmount to obedience, obeying your father and mother. Right? But once again, honour is lifelong. And I love how Marshall Siegel, this Christian writer, he put it in a succinct way that parents are given a seasonal authority over children and in that younger stage in life, they are to obey their parents. But parents are endowed with perpetual honour. And that's our role. But once again, allow me to repeat, dear friends, Honour is hard. I, mean, I know that. And some of you, frankly, even listening now, will come to me and say, in the back of your minds, Adrian, you don't know my parents. You don't know what they've made me go through. You don't know the hurt they've caused me. You don't know what they've done. And perhaps, therefore, I remind us again, you're right. I don't. I would love to hear and listen to your story, but I don't. But that's why I thank God that God knows. And that's why at the back of it all, the foundation of it all. Let's bank and show ourselves in the perfect gospel who works through imperfect people, imperfect family, so that he might be glorified. But here, right off the cuff, easy enough to understand why must we obey and honour our parents? And God's word is clear. We obey and honour our parents because it's right. That's what verse 1 said. This is God's design in how He created things to be. It's foundational to life and all of relationships as a whole. Right? Because Paul knows that in every culture, the reality is that God has in every culture, in every civilization, in created order itself, there is a way of doing things. There is authority that He has placed to rule over. And in that how in the design of the grand scheme of things, there is even obedience to be carried out. Even in nature, in Psalm 107, it says that God commands the winds, the storms. But he also says then in Psalm 107 verse 29, that same command where he commands and raises the stormy wind, he also in that same command makes the storms be still and they obey. So this idea of obeying also and following through is needed in the family home because this is how life and relationships is to be. As a, as a child learning obedience in the family, he or she is also learning, we are learning as well, obedience in our marketplace, in our offices, in the country, in our home, etc. 
and for what it's worth, to our young adults who might be looking for a spouse to be, uh, as a marriage mentor myself, I do say and share that if you're looking for someone to date, please do observe how they treat their own parents. Because trust me, it is indicative of their own attitude and, underst- and how they treat those of senior, their, your, even your parents also. Honouring and obeying our parents sets us and helps us understand the idea of authority, the idea of submission, the idea also then that recognising that God is sovereign in this world. So obey the Lord. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But of course, we want to be clear as well. When it says in the Lord, we are also then saying that you obey your parents when the commands or instructions from your parents are right and righteous. Because ultimately, our allegiance and our obedience is to the Father, the Heavenly Father. So, of course, then in that scheme of, scheme of things, we have to also be wise that if they were to ask us to do something immoral, for example, we have to stand that ground. Right? That is how things are as well. But when it says that obey your parents in the Lord, note, my dear young people today, that it's in the Lord, not in our own minds. I.e., when we sometimes think, and I would fully agree, when we obey because we feel that, uh, when we obey because when we choose to not obey because we think that parents are not right and so I'm not going to obey. God is saying, even if you, maybe you feel, not about morality here, if you feel that it's not right, for the Lord's sake, because you love the Lord, because Jesus is your saviour, would you still obey the Lord? And this is something that parents then later on, we have to understand as well and, and grow in that. Because there are different kinds of obedience, right? Um, just recently, in my own parenting journey, I've observed three kinds of obedience. The first kind of obedience, the most effective, defined as effective, defined as they will follow, is when your children obey out of fear. You're jolly well, go and clean the room now. At this moment, move. Which unfortunately is something you hear quite a bit in my family. They obey out of fear. They scuttle to the room and trust me, there are times that they are afraid of this black face here. Second thing that children will obey, just the other day, my son was really, really sweet. Oh man, I loved it. He, I, I came home one day, uh, well, I came home and he said, Daddy, 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 I've done all my homework, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I completed everything already. And you know how, Daddy? Yeah, I've even done next week's homework and read forward. Wow! Amazing! Pause, went to go to the toilet, come out. Daddy, can I have computer time now? <laughs> they obey because they want um, something, right? But the kind of obedience that God is saying here is the third kind of obedience. Just the other day, also, the same first son that asked me this, these are the, the, the things I need to remind myself. I was in the car, and I was coming home, uh, I was just dropped him off, and I was coming, um, going back to work, and my son called me and he said, Daddy, 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 oh yes, by the way, uh, I listened to you, there's something happened in school, I listened to you, I heard, um, I did all that you did, I did all you asked me to do, and it was great, and you know, Daddy, just now we talked about a hornbill flying, you know, and you told, told us about that bird, well, when, when Aaron and I walked down uh, from our home, we saw two hornbills flying, and it was so interesting and so beautiful, we stopped there, we admired, then we went upstairs, and we now totally shower, and we're all ready for nap time and work, wow, I was waiting for the what next, okay, then he just said, okay, Daddy, that's all I to tell you. I love you. Bye-bye. Oh. But, but that's the kind of obedience that God is looking for in children when we obey, isn't it? When he did all that, he called me about his hornbill it's just to share with me his day. And you know, at that moment, from a parent's perspective, frankly, right, even if he don't ask me about computer time, I might probably still give, you know? <laughs> Maybe something else. Lah. But you get the point. Even if, he didn't, even if he didn't ask me about what he wanted, in that moment when I knew that he loves me and he proclaimed and he did all this because he loves me, I've been more than happy to just give 
And that's the kind of obedience that young ones, God wants of us, and even as children, to obey. Because when we do that, we are also then mirroring, we are learning what it means to obey the Father. In this obedience, we are learning about how God Himself desires to be the Father who showers forth His blessing to us. So when we honour and obey our parents, because right is God's design, it helps us understand about life and relationships. But secondly, understanding how to obey and honour our parents and it being right is fundamental in our worship of God. Because God also says, basically what He's saying is that if you want to, if you desire to be my child, my disciple, and you want to grow as a disciple of Christ, it is fundamental, imperative, that you learn to honour your parents, regardless of the background that you have come from. And this is seen in how it's ordered. It says here in, in Ephesians 6, 2, that honour your father and mother, in a bracket there, this is the first commandment with a promise. In the Ten Commandments, this is taken from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, 16, the first four commandments are about God. The first commandment is about putting God above everyone else. The second one is about worshipping God in the way He has appointed the third is about honouring God's name. The fourth is about honouring God's day, the Sabbath. And then you see, interestingly enough, before Commandments 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which talk about adultery and murder and all that, lying and stealing, he puts a command there, honour your parents. After the part about God, before the part about how you live life pertaining to your conduct, smack there, honour your parents. What God is saying here is that after you understand about honouring God and worshipping God next in line, you need to learn how to honour and obey your parents even before you how to lead your life otherwise. So we cannot, and I say this strongly, we cannot say I love and worship God with all my heart if we are unwilling to learn how to honour and obey our parents. I say this again. We cannot say with all our heart, I love and honour and worship God if we don't strive to learn how to honour and obey our parents. And for young ones, I also have then perhaps this warning, I suppose. Because of the way God wired us to be, the reality is that if we do not obey and honour our parents, we probably will honour and obey others who or that who might not care about our well-being. Once again, in God's design, ingrained within us is a desire, a, de a homing beacon, so to speak, for us to honour and obey our parents. And if we don't, it will, something else in this world will draw and could demand your honour and obedience. And unfortunately, in the ways of this world, that reality is that that force or person or whatever you want to call it. It can come in the manner of a person, a, a hobby, a group of people or whatnot. That thing that draws your attention, that demands that you obey and honour them, might not want you, might not have your welfare at heart. Once again, this is God's design for us and for the family. And He's saying, even if your families are not, in that sense, worthy of honour because some of us might be thinking that. Do so as you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let me then propose to us how might we honour? Now, there are so many different ways, so many ways, but I come to these three areas perhaps um, because I feel that these are areas that are challenging enough and I felt the Lord having a word for us in this. So once again, are, this is not exhaustive, but these are just three ways I feel that we can honour our parents, be it whether you are, once again, a 12-year-old uh, youth, 25-year-old young adult, a 40-year-old someone like me, or 60-year-old, 70-year-old with senior parents as well. The first, empathise. Part of this, of course, includes the idea of listening. Empathy 
has this picture where we enter and are willing to enter into the world of someone else and learn to see things and feel things from where they are. But the reality in today's society is that it's very hard, frankly, to empathize. It's hard. And so as part of this, perhaps, I invited our friends at Graceworks. They published a book recently called The Generations Project, and they set a book table downstairs. They felt this need as well. Actually, this project started as a young adult thing, but they realized over time as they worked on it, they realized, therefore, that there was lack of empathy among the generations. And so this Generations Project, this book, was a project that seeks to increase empathy among the different generations between each other. And they did so by research. They actually interviewed many people across the generations to help us understand. And in fact, let me read a section here. It was a scenario where intergenerations, they, they, was, they, they were just, they said they couldn't understand each other and they felt they were right and others were wrong. You know, like how sometimes, and this goes both ways, um, someone senior would say in a dinner table, you know, I know back in my time, uh, we were so poor, you know. Back in Ireland, we were so poor and we had nothing to eat. Look, you all got money, you all can go for a party and all that. And then the young one at the table then feels that, yeah, but that your time, pardon the language here, police wear shorts. But now, look at our time. It's, the world is so complex. There are so many factors. You only had one choice to go one way. Now I have five choices to go to school. It is, it's not as easy as you think. Generations thinking they're right and other generations thinking that they're wrong. And so the team that did this Generations Project realized that we needed to grow in empathy and understanding each other. And let me read a section here because the realities when they found out is that here in, we are in a unique time in history where there are at least six generations shaped by different formative experiences living and working together. Because of the acceleration of change, six different worldviews, generations living in, in Singapore today. And we are so often in the midst of our family wounds, we brush it aside, we say we don't understand, we don't want to understand. But yet, as disciples of Christ, shouldn't we be the first to learn to understand and empathize with each other? And so, once again, the book will be downstairs, sold downstairs. I encourage you to, to buy a couple of copies, to read it, and to hopefully un help you understand better different generations, even then as we work to also be a, small, be a church with small group churches where we also perhaps live and minister to those of different generations. Empathize is one of them. Secondly, how may we honour and encourage and esteem? One of the things that our parents so often need as children is encouragement. Because sometimes we don't. I don't need a hands out on this, but I personally feel that sometimes encouraging my family members sometimes even harder to encourage than even non-family members. Agree? Sometimes we feel that they know us so, so they know us inside out. What's the point of encouraging? We feel so embarrassed and want to encourage. It feels strange. It feels awkward. But as children to parents, will we encourage by a word, by a note? Will we be, and this is, not, this is not just a Western Christian thing, but will we be willing to say even words of, I love you, for what you have done, for who you are? Esteem. Esteem meaning that holding and holding them in regard. Let me just use what Tim Keller wrote, which is nice. Tim Keller wrote this when he talked about this fifth commandment here. He said, respect. Their, I mean, respect the parents' need to see themselves in you. Respect their need to see themselves in you. What do I mean? I love the practice, you know, I love the practice when I walk with my young adults. Uh, many of them take the time during weddings to give and say words of encouragement, of honour to their parents. I love that. That's what I mean, holding in esteem to say what, Ma, I learned, I learned from you as I was growing up 
this principle of saving and cutting according to my cloth. Pa, I learned from you the principle and, the, and, and this, I love to be adventurous because I picked it up from you when you brought me out on cycling trips and all that. These are the things that parents need to hear. They need to see themselves in you because in parents as well as being a parent, I recognize that I, part of me as I try to raise my children the best way possible, I want to know how I've impacted their life so that I know what God is doing. But sometimes we don't do that. And so one way we can honour our parents is to put them, esteem them, both privately and even publicly. And more regularly even. Right? Because I assure you, dear friends, that sometimes we don't know how much of our parents we carry with us until perhaps it's too late. What do I mean? I shared this story three years ago about my own losing my own biological father some time back and about how, well, it was a time of processing for me, right? I wouldn't be labeled that part, but a second half of the story I wanted to share today. We came from a broke, I came from a broken family. He divorced my mom, for those, of all, for those of us who didn't hear this story of mine when very young because of adultery. And so he, he was out of my life since I was six years old. When I went to the funeral, I went not expecting anything. I went wanting closure. Right? And when I went, it was, what was interesting was what they played during the funeral itself were his favorite songs. They played oldies, Carpenters, The Beatles. Right? Now, I don't listen to oldies very much, but these were his favorite songs. And I knew every single one of those songs because they were my favorites as well. But that wasn't what shook me. When I went down to the casket, I realized that he was wearing a football jersey. For those of you who know me, you know what football club I support. And guess what football club my natural father supported. Now, you can ask yourselves, biological, I don't know. The fact is that all these things that I, I learned and picked up was not picked up through nurture. But what I'm saying is this. There's a lot in our lives that we learned, and I learned this firsthand now, from our biological parents that God has given to us for a reason, for us to understand, for us as we grow in our journey of honouring and obeying our parents. Don't let that slip by. Esteem our parents. And lastly then here, extend grace. What I mean is this, initiate. Because more often not in our families, we are saying to ourselves, how, I, I can't, Pastor Adrian, I can't because you don't understand how much they've done wrong in my life, how much they put me down, how much they didn't encourage me, how much dirt they made me go through. But I say to us, because of the gospel of Christ, because of the unconditional love given to each and every one of us through Jesus Christ dying on the cross, will we take that initiative and extend grace to honour? Because of the gospel, we then initiate. It's not about calculating who went first. It's about doing it because Jesus redeemed me and rescued me. And in my love for Christ, I will honour and love Him and learn what God has in store for me and wants me to learn as I love and honour my parents, regardless of what happened. It means then, even when wrong comes, become humble and we say, help me listen. Someone, when I was younger, gave me this advice that, this line that I share with us today. You ought to honour your parents for having brought you into the world as God's design. But you don't have to approve the choices they've made in life. You ought to honour your parents for having brought you in this world as God's design, but you don't have to approve the choices they've made in life. And you carrying on through the gospel of Christ, honour 
them initiate. Don't wait for them to come to you. This is the word for children. What about the word for fathers? In Ephesians 6 verse 4. To the parents out there, we switch gear here. Parenting is hard. Virginia Satire, who is uh, the mother of family therapy, she phrased it, and I, I take some things here. She says that parents teach in the toughest school in the world because you are the school in the school for making people. You are the, M, uh, you are the Ministry of education, ed, education, you are the principal, you are the teacher, you are the cleaner, you are expected to be expert on all things in life. And sometimes the challenge also is that in your school of making people, you're also working with some other person who is of equal rank with you, and then sometimes that can be so frustrating as well. It's tough. The quote that I resonate most with is this quote. Before I was married, I had three theories about raising kids. Now that I have three children, I have no more theories about raising kids because... <laughs> yeah. It's tough. And that's why I love it here that when Paul, he, he, he resonates and he understands the challenge that parents have. Now, a word here. Here, the word is fathers, right? Uh, let me give you a word. Um, there are scholars who say that the fathers here can also be translated as parents. Fair enough. I agree that it can also be seen as parents because I agree that the word that Paul has for us can be applied to both mother and father. But distinctly, why the masculine form was used in terms of fathers is because ultimately, fathers, we have the responsibility to guide our families and children in the Lord. And that's just the way God has designed to be. It's a natural flow, and you'll hear from me next week in Ephesians 5, when God says, the husbands, you are the head of the household. In that natural flow of headship, from head of the mother as well, his wife, you carry on being the head also of your children. So fathers, we have to get involved in the lives of our children. Right? And so that's why here there's a specific sp uh, slant toward fathers, although the command itself applies to both father and mother. But fathers, we have to get involved. We bear that primary responsibility. But what I'm saying here is that Paul empathizes with parents, with fathers, about the, the reality of having our children and, and raising out in the Lord. It's hard. And, and that's why he says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger because, and I'll be frank with you, there are stages in my life, my week, parents, I don't know where you empathize with this, where, you know, sometimes I feel so drawn out and tired and, and inside me, frankly, is this simmering point of, it's just so exhausting. Can I have my space, please, my boys? And then it all oh, it takes a little bit of a... And then, and then I just suddenly burst out. Right? Because anger is often just simmering and, and anger destroys families. I'm going to explain that a little bit. But I also do want to mention, so today, I felt led by the Lord to focus on the part about anger, don't, not provoking our children to anger. I won't be focusing on discipline and instruction, but I do want to then highlight that every first Sunday of the month, we have a parent-to-parent -parent mentoring, where we do desire to help parents grow together to understand and learn how to bring children up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we have that as a platform for us to grow together. But also in upcoming Kids Camp in June, specifically for this Kids Camp, there's also a parent-child element in a Saturday where then parents would then in play with their children and learn about each other from that parent-child experience in the Kids Camp. And so we put this in intentionally in what we do because we desire to grow ourselves as parents who discipline and instruct our children in the Lord. But once again, back to the part about anger. Why is it so destructive? And why is it there? Because anger devours other emotions. Of all the emotions that we have, this perhaps is the one that is most destructive. Three days ago, I had a conversation with number two, Aaron. I had him in the car, my number one was sick, so I had him one-to-one -one in the car. And I asked Aaron, just checking in, hey, Aaron, 
what, can you tell daddy, what do you dislike about daddy? And then what do you like about daddy? And he paused and I said, son, it's a safe space. It's okay. What do you dislike about daddy? Ask Lord, Lord, please, please help me. I'm driving here. Please help me. <laughs> he said, um, daddy, I don't like it when you spank me. Okay, fair enough, right? Who, who would? Then what do you like about daddy? Oh, I like that daddy tells me he loves me. I like that daddy hugs me tight, tight and kisses me. So I went a bit further. Son, you know, daddy also disciplines you out of love. You know that, right? When you hear, when you see daddy experience daddy disciplining you, can you differentiate between discipline from love and discipline from anger? He frankly said, no. Daddy, I can't. Thank God, God kept me safe on the road because that answer was, wow. Why? Because the times when I discipline out of anger, I realized the volume, the look of my face, how much intensity it is, has overwhelmed his experience of how I otherwise would discipline out of love. And he can't differentiate it because at five years old, to him, any form of discipline is made out of anger and he doesn't like it. Because I have not learned how to discipline well and to be tender-hearted, to, to nourish and discipline the Lord. Because the anger that I've done, unfortunately, as a parent learning this, all this, overwhelms and overshadows all the good things that I've done. Anger devours other emotions so much so that in our families, we carry with us when we are children and it festers. And that's why I felt led by the Lord today to talk about this. Because when we say, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, the reality also is that perhaps in our own childhood bring up, we were faced with so much anger ourselves that we don't know how to also then discipline our children without anger. We're struggling ourselves. And if we don't unpack it, if we don't process it, be it whether we are a child now or we are a parent now, we are headed down a destructive path. Eric Raymond, just a quick quote here. You may not be a gentle person, but you must be a gentle parent because you cannot nourish someone carelessly or harshly. And so my call to us is that, and this, this by the way appears to us, it's also for us as children, please do not let unresolved anger in ourselves or our children fester into bitterness because this is often the cause of hurts. It's often the cause when we don't want to open up our hearts for reconciliation. We don't want, and we sell, tell God, God, you don't understand, I don't want to do this. I don't want reconciliation. I don't want to be the first to start because of all this that was happened to me. And it happens when this anger in ourselves and our kids fester into bitterness. That's why I go back to Ephesians 4 because Paul did talk about this earlier. In his whole train of thought, Ephesians 4, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Give no opportunity to the devil because that anger that is unresolved becomes and leaves us, and I quote from John Piper here, leaves us empty and we are but a shadow of ourselves because all that remains is bitterness and rage and we are unable then to nourish tender-heartedly. And so, dear friends, I ask too that in this whole scheme of things, as a child, as a parent, we need to learn to be humble, to resolve this anger. The longer we let it fester, the longer the devil will have a foothold in our life, and the harder it is to break. Elder Ronald had a wonderful sermon on forgiveness about a month back. And I asked that we maybe go back and listen to that and may the word of God convict us. 
So then the final word I have for us perhaps is then, how do we marry both together between parents and children? Our, many of us, once again, are children as well. Gospel forgiveness. Because once again, it's not about having a picture-perfect family. It's about letting the perfect gospel work in imperfect people, in imperfect families, to glorify this perfect God. I go back to Ephesians 4 because this is exactly what Paul has written about. And then Ephesians 6, he says, apply this to your families. That's why he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor be put away. Instead, dear parents, may we parent with tenderheartedness as children. May we forgive one another because as God in Christ forgave you. God has forgiven each one of us. And the only remedy to removing, to re replacing that anger with tenderheartedness is forgiveness that comes from the cross of Calvary. Let me close by a story that was written by Ernest Hemingway. He wrote a story titled The Capital of the World. And in this story, Hemingway wrote about a father and his estranged son named Paco. And as such, Paco ran away from home. Ran away from home in all his despair, he wanted to take on the very, jo the very job that many in Spain didn't want, although he paid highly. Paco wanted to be a bullfighter, a matador, because for him, he felt that his life was not worth living anymore. And so for him, let me just go into the, the, the occupation that is the most risk. Yes, methodos were paid well and looked on highly, but I'm going to go there because my life is not worth anything. And the father heard it. It struck his heart because my son is going into the ring with a bull and he wants this to be his life work. And so the father went all around trying his best to locate his son, locate Paco and say, son, please, I need to talk to you about this. But Paco being such a common name, he couldn't find his son. He just heard rumours that his son was somewhere in Madrid. And so this story, the father then decided, in his desperation, he put an ad in the paper. He wrote down there, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday all is forgiven, love, Papa. And the father hoped upon hope that his son would see the ad and just maybe, maybe he will come to the Hotel Montana. On Tuesday, noon came. The father made his way to the hotel. Suddenly surprised by why traffic was so heavy. He weaved through, he saw many police officers wondering what in the world was happening. He got to the Hotel Montana, the staff themselves were wondering and he realised in front of the hotel were 800 young men named Paco wanting to come in front of the Hotel Montana looking to seek reconciliation that they so desperately needed. So once again, I don't know where we are in our families. And I wish I could have special, special commands and, and, and word from how the Lord wants to appropriate His word in your life. I wish I did, but I don't. But I do have this. That means all the brokenness, the Lord desires us that as we love Him, we forgive. It's hard. Of course it's hard. We're imperfect people. But the perfect gospel, in the hands of a perfect God, He desires to use us imperfect people to glorify Him, to use the pain so that we can experience even more His forgiveness.
So this morning, I felt led for us to pray for each other. You notice there is no corporate prayer today because I felt led that maybe for some of us in our families, we've actually not prayed together as a family in a very long time. Husbands, wives, even as children, maybe we haven't prayed with our father and mother in such a long time. We haven't prayed prayers of protection, prayers of blessing, prayers of reconciliation. We haven't prayed prayers of just connecting and submitting ourselves to the Father. We haven't prayed together in a long time. And this morning, I felt led that maybe at this moment, to give us that opportunity to pray in our family groups. And even if you are here alone today, if you feel comfortable, maybe you can turn to the person next to you and pray for your family. Or if you're not, even in that moment then, you need to pray for your family if you have not prayed for them in a while. And not just about that, not about just about the health and, and studies and all that. I know that's important, but to pray God's love, that God's forgiveness, that His reconciliation will flow through your family to turn it around, to grow it, to recommit your family to the Lord. And not just that, we are also a spiritual family, so there's much to pray for in that respect as well. So I invite us now, for the next couple of moments, for those of us in our, who are sitting in our families, husbands, wives, children, I invite you now to turn to each other and to pray for each other right now. Parents, if your children are with you, just pray a prayer of blessing over them. Once again, if you are alone, I, if you're comfortable, you can turn a person next to you and pray for your family. We can give us ourselves time for that. If it needs be walking across the aisle, be it. Or if you feel uncomfortable, maybe then you can just be alone bow your heads and in this sacred moment commit your family to the Lord. We're going to spend some moments in prayer submitting and committing ourselves as God's as families as God's family as well to the Lord. For those who have finished praying, would you stand together with me so that I can close in prayer together? For those who have finished praying, will we for the rest who are still praying? As a church, we value God's design for family. But yet we know we live on this side of heaven where the fall has impacted our lives. And I can guarantee that there is no perfect family. 
on earth. All of us have our own pains and brokenness. And may that today we ask the Lord to guide us to His design to embrace the order of God's design, God's order for His design for family. And whatever pain and brokenness that we may have, we can surrender at the foot of the cross the gospel of forgiveness and know that God can restore and God can heal. God can meet their need and God can use us to bless and nourish our family as well. So let us pray together. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for reconcil reconciling us back to the Heavenly Father. We were once also having this broken family. But yet, Lord, we thank you, Jesus Christ, for down on the cross so that we can be reconciled back to the Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for bringing us back to yourself. And because we see the way how you go all out to rescue us and bring us back to become your family, we know that, Lord, you can redeem all broken families among us as well. Lord, I want to pray for parents, pray for fathers. I pray the Lord you'll forgive us if we have exasperated our children, provoked them into anger and bitterness. Lord, it could be because we have not been exemplary, because we tell them something, but we're doing another thing. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us if we have been disciplining our children with anger and that devours our emotion and causing us, O oh God, to give a lot of careless and harsh a way of dealing with our children. Forgive us. I pray the Lord you will heal us as well and heal our children for any misunderstanding and pain they might receive from our brokenness and failure. Now I also want to pray for the children. The Lord, you will bless every one of us who are children of our parents. And the Lord, you will help us, O oh God, to know what it means to obey our parents in the Lord in the Lord Lord help us help us to know this is your order Lord and to honour them to empathise to encourage to esteem them and the Lord will be able to know how Lord to see beyond any of their faults but be able to see their brokenness and their needs Lord in this imperfect world teach us Lord to learn to embrace one another in the family because of Christ, the gospel. And I pray that, Lord, the gospel of forgiveness will unite us together so that, God, we can be a family united for your glory and honour. And finally, I pray for any of the brothers and sisters among us who are estranged from their family, who struggle and having a lot of pain and there's unhealed wounds and they are estranged from their family. Heal them, Lord, from the pain and that the spiritual family will always be a refuge for them. We also pray for parents who are grieving over their prodigal children. Lord, be with them. I know it's very painful. Help them, Lord, to know there is hope that you as a heavenly father yes. who has gone all out for your prodigal yes. children like us, you will grant them hope yes. and patience and perseverance to know that God, they can look to you. Yes. Look to you for their children as well. So Lord, reign God. I pray that in this this will be a church that Lord will able, able to hold spaces for one another in our brokenness, even in our broken family. Yes. And to love one another as spiritual family. Thank you, dear Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we close with this song? A song of hope, a song of declaring that amidst all our brokenness, His mercy is more. Darkness, you every morn, I'll 
sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait? What patience would wait as we constantly walk? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness, what riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood in the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, you every morn, our sins they are many. His praise the Lord, praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness. You every morn, our sins they are many. His mercy is more, our sins they are many. His mercy, our sins, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Thank you, Jesus. So from Ephesians, may Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Please be seated. The service is now over. For those of us requiring prayer, a word of encouragement, please feel free to come forward to the front. God bless you and have a good week ahead.